Hello and welcome back to this channel. In this video we are going to be talking about the greatest Spider-Man movie in existence for live action and that is Spider-Man No Way Home. To be honest, this film is very likely to be better than anything else that has come before it in terms of the live action ad adaptations of this character. And I say that knowing full well that for pretty much my entire life, the best Spider-Man movie that I've always cherished is Spider-Man 2 with Tobey Maguire. And today, in this day and age, I am very much considering that this new Spider-Man film is even better than that and might take the spot at number one. Now, I haven't made a personal final decision, but I must say that probably objectively, this film can easily take the top Spider-Man film slot and is also in the upper echelon in terms terms of Marvel MCU films and that is just insane to think about as a person that grew up with Spider-Man that has always been a Spider-Man fan that is a probably a high uh, 9 to a 9.5 out of 10 and I think that this film is near perfect in that regard so I think it deserves that type of a rating there are a couple things that you know I've thought about it for a day or two that aren't absolutely perfect but it is like as close realistically to a perfect film that I could conceive of and that is what we get with this and I'm so glad that I watched this film. That being said if you have not already seen the film please click off there are going to be spoilers in the rest of the video. So without further ado let's jump into it this is your warning. So let's begin with the setup of this film. Now we start off right where we ended in the last Spider-Man film with Peter Parker's identity being revealed to the world. So we have Peter who's freaking out. He's got to help MJ who's kind of being mobbed by these random New Yorkers being like, oh, do you know him or whatnot? And, you know, from there, they like swing around the city. Ned calls them and things are just trying to starting to go to hell because of this. And we have what is probably the most awkward scene following this, which is the scene where when you know they all end up at home and there's the whole conversation with Happy and Aunt May. I just I, I didn't like this part of the film. This was like an awkward beginning moment because it was like something new and also it was very awkward because they were like abruptly ending this kind of relationship that we had that could have been really cute or could have been really nice and they just weren't having any of it. So I mean you know, it wasn't really necessary, but it happened, and it was like this awkward breakup, which I think was partially intentional, but also, like, it kind of took you out a little bit at the very start. But that being said, you know, it's it's like a minute, or like, it's not really a big part of the film here, so I kind of give it a pass, because everything after this is is pretty spot on. Now, we actually get into the setup here where all the kids, you know, we got MJ, we got Peter, we got Ned, they're trying to get into college. And unfortunately, because of the involvement with the whole Mysterio incident, there is this kind of stigma around them. There's a lot of negative press and there's a lot of confusion as to what exactly happened in that, um, in that story in the previous film. And as a result, all these different schools are automatically rejecting Peter Parker and the people closest to him. And as a result, none of them get into the schools of their dream. And unfortunately, none of these three highly in intelligent individuals who are supposedly all capable of entering MIT, because that, that is kind of the implication here, um, that they are actually qualified to go to MIT, um, is that none of them think to actually talk to admissions after this and, you know, try and get a chance at a potential shot, even after being rejected. And I, I don't know, I just thought that was a little odd, but then again, you know, you're you're just getting out of high school, right? You don't really know what the rules are with college admissions because it's very vague and no one really prepares you. Guidance counselors do not teach you what you're doing for college. So maybe it's partially that also because they're 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 not very helpful and you're just kind of thrown into this area where you're, you know, applying for schools, don't really know what's going on, and you just kind of have to figure it out and you think, you know, you got rejected, that's the end of it. You know, for the most part, most kids are probably in the same shoes there, but, you know, if you're intelligent enough to be going into, like, some of the highest 
ranking schools, uh, uh, at least in the country or whatever. You should be able to ask some more questions than that, as opposed to what Peter does, which is go and see Doctor Strange. Now, this is where things actually start to ramp up, and this is where, like, from here on out, like, the film is off to the races, and this is why this film is so good. Every act just builds and builds and builds, and it just, no, no flaws beyond this point, honestly, apart from one character, but, like, it's, like, a minute flaw, but beyond that, it's, it's fine, it's fine. Like, it's perfectly amazing. It didn't take me out of the movie at all from here on out. And I, I must say, like, the entire scene with Doctor Strange is just nice because it's, like, it's not the same as with Mysterio. It's not the same as with Tony. It's different because they're more like peers at this point. Or at the very least, that's what it starts off as. And, and Doctor Strange kind of sees him a little bit more like an adult than he really is because, well... They saved the universe together. And if you're going to do that with someone, you know, you don't got to treat them like they are above you in in terms of status, right? He is not Sir. He's just, he's just Steven, man. Like, they're on the same level, same wavelength. And then he realizes that Peter is being an absolute stupid person. And, you know, he doesn't give Strange all the specifics here. But also, Strange is being a, bit, a little bit of a, like, a, a bullhead here. And he doesn't just stop the spell, which is, is weird. Like, you would think that if you were casting a spell, you could just cancel the spell there. But perhaps this is just... It's a complicated spell. Once you start it, you have to go through with it. And making changes is just destabilizing, right? That's that's what seems to be the case. But also potentially, like, Steven just doesn't feel like stopping the spell for some reason. Perhaps that fits. Perhaps that also fits here. And I like this like feeling of being unclear as to what exactly goes awry here like clearly it's peter's fault but i mean does steven also share some responsibility here yes because steven immediately just says all right let's let's figure it out let's do it right away and he doesn't ask any questions and he just assumes that peter has done like everything beforehand to like make sure things like this is the last resort or whatever but he doesn't actually verify that he doesn't ask any questions to figure out what specifically peter wants because dr strange is like you know it makes sense he just wants everyone in the world including myself all the avengers everyone that has known him and and loves him to just forget that he's spider-man you know that that sounds like a wonderful idea let's not ask for specifics let's just jump into it and so you know definitely in my opinion, Strange is a little bit responsible for what happens here as well. But Peter's also being an idiot. So that's just that's just kind of where we're at. Going back a little bit. Let's go back a little bit. And I think I think it's a little bit before this where we meet a certain character that people have been saying was in this movie, but I didn't believe that he was actually in this film. And that and that is Matt Murdock. Now the fact that Matt Murdock is in this film is absolutely phenomenal. And this is the first of many things in this film that just make just make it so much better. And he's only there for like a minute and it's okay because it's fantastic. Because what this does is potentially in our brains as fans, we can wonder like, what does this mean? Does this mean everything is canon? Is it their own version, like J. Jonah Jameson? Like, what are they doing here? Is this, is the Daredevil universe, the Defenders universe, is that an alternate reality? Or is it actually being weaved in completely? Like, I hope not, because I'd, I'd, I'd rather not have Danny Rand continue, because that was the most boring series that came out. Like, that's a show that you can't watch more than one episode of, of either season. And it's just that's just a fact that's just a fact I, I don't think anyone would disagree with me and if you do you're wrong all the other characters you know bringing them back having that as a possibility is absolutely fantastic I mean and spoilers for Hawkeye right Kingpin exists in the MCU me as a fan of Daredevil this 100% confirms because I refuse to believe anything else. I refuse to believe anything else. This means the final battle, that bloody mess of a fight between Daredevil and Kingpin actually happened. With him dressed in black and Dare uh, and uh, and Kingpin dressed in white 
covered in blood, that three-way battle with with uh, with Bullseye, like that happened. There is there's nothing that anyone can say to tell me in this moment that that is not facts. That did not happen in the MCU. It did. Okay, and I will take it as such until Kevin Feige tells me I'm wrong. And even then, I will just be angry at Kevin Feige because that needs to be true. It like it has to be true, and that is what this scene does. And of course, we know Matt Murdock has his abilities because a rocket's thrown in the window, and Daredevil catches it. He just puts out his arm right in front of Peter's head and catches it. Peter just says to him, "Like, how did you do that?" And his response, because this actually somehow answers the question, "I'm a very good lawyer. I'm very good at my job." That's what he says. He's like, "I'm not. I'm not gonna give you a proper answer, but also, you know, clearly, me be- being a blind lawyer, like." If I'm just a blind guy, I can't catch rocks randomly, but me being a blind lawyer, it makes all, it makes all the sense now, of course, that I can just catch this object randomly. But hey, it's great. It's wonderful because we get to see like, oh, oh, he's being big brained about it. They're, they're nodding at his abilities. You know, he, he is there. He is the daredevil. And that is just phenomenal for me as a fan of this character. All right, let's talk about the Nefarious Five. Yes, you heard me right. The Nefarious Five. There are five villains. It's not the Sinister Six, okay? We are going with the Nefarious Five. There's there's no other name that I think fits better here. Possibly there is, but you know, for this purpose, for the video, it's the Nefarious Five, all right? And I say the Nefarious Five because we have Green Goblin, Dr. Otto Octavius. We got... Sandman, we got the lizard, and of course we have Electro. There is a scene here when Green Goblin walks in to the basement of the Sanctum Sanctorum, and we have all these people in the same room. Everyone else is caged up, and you know, Green Goblin also gets caged up in a second, but we have this amazing moment between Flint Marco, I'm pretty sure it's Flint, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Flint, um, we have Otto Octavius and we have Norman Osborn. They're just talking. You know, Otto's like, how the heck are you here? How are you alive? Right? How is this happening? And then Sandman's like, how are both of you here? You're both dead. What the heck's going on there? It's just interesting. I don't know. Sandman's the only one that's living here. Like, he's he's the only one alive. But I like to think that, you know, the stakes are a little bit different. He's going to die. I'm just going to say he's going to die. But they have this very, very cool continuity type of moment here because Otto and Norman seem to be somewhat familiar with who each other are and like their work. And it's something that we don't get to see in the Tobey Maguire films, but it adds more continuity and a little bit more world building into that universe. And I am all all for it. It's awesome and it's lovely. And it just adds an extra dimension to the story that we've already seen. It adds an extra layer and does something new. I will talk a little bit more about the two of the main characters or the two main villains that I would say um, from the Tobey Maguire series. It's Otto and uh, and Osborn. But first, I do want to talk about the scene that happens pretty soon after this. And that is once Peter finds out that everyone's about to die if they get sent back. Peter's like, you know, let's not do that. That's not okay. And Strange, you know, Strange, in some ways, Strange is actually correct, I would say, because, you know, infinite possibilities, infinite universes, infinite everything, these five people, or four people rather, dying, it doesn't mean anything because there's probably a reality out there in which they didn't die. So, and also, when you think about, like, potentially things from other shows, like Loki, like, you don't really know what's gonna happen, like, like, what does it really mean? Is that just a branching of the timeline if you save them? Like, it's going to be one version that you saved them, one version that you didn't. Like, what's going on there? We don't really know. Or does it actually fundamentally alter the universe with this spell? We're not sure. The indication here is that, to Doctor Strange, it doesn't matter because infinite possibilities, man. And to Peter, it's like, you know, I don't want these people to die. That's kind of screwed up. Let's not do that. And so they have to fight. They have to fight and they go into the mirror dimension and this is when things get crazy because this is a moment that shows Peter's intelligence which was highly necessary for this Peter Parker. And I, I say that because the other two Spider-Men, 
you see moments of their intelligence a lot more or a little bit more. I mean, Peter is studying under Otto Octavius in Spider-Man 2 for a little bit. And on top of that, like you have Andrew Garfield, who is basically like, developing his own web fluid. He, I believe he also creates the um, ability, the the serum to cure the lizard in that film and stuff like that. Like he does all these sciencey things. And so you know that those two are like very smart. And of the two, you'd, I would probably say Andrew Garfield has a little bit more in terms of his feats of intelligence. Toby doesn't have to create web shooters. He doesn't have to really deal with that stuff. It's just his abilities, right? So in our version with Tom, we have a version here who hasn't, had to really create amazing suits. His powers are like cool and everything, but his web shooters are like, we've seen parts of it from the original film where it was like, oh, he has to create web shooters or whatever, that's cool. Um, but it's like nothing really high tech, right? Or it doesn't seem like it's like the final form of a web shooter, right? And the web shooters that he has, the suit that he has, everything that he uses in battle is Stark tech, right? So having him use his brain in this fight with all these fractals, basically around him and I don't know exactly what the words were but he was like you know it's all geometry right things are being messed with and manipulated by mirrors and it's creating these weird geometrical shapes that are like typically impossible to have in the universe and he uses that to his advantage because you know he has a high uh, high level of knowledge in mathematics and so he uses his webs and is able to instantly snare um, Doctor Strange and steals his sling ring which shows his forethought <laughs> um and then goes back without him, trapping Doctor Strange. And I really liked that because it wasn't like they really nerfed either character here. Doctor Strange isn't trying to, like, completely eradicate Peter Parker. He's not trying to really stop him. He's just trying to keep him away long enough to press the button. And he's not really looking for a fight. Because if he did, I mean, he could, he could easily have taken out Peter at the start, right? He's just like... He's just like, get back, I'm doing what's right, what's best, and Peter just disagrees with what that is, and that's how we get this fight. And I really enjoyed this, because it gives us a legitimate enough reason for Doctor Strange not to be in this entire film, meanwhile, like, allowing Peter to go on his journey, and allow the stakes to continue and being high, and... Meanwhile, Doctor Strange is going to show up later on to potentially help out in the third act. Now, after that, we end up in the apartment, Happy's apartment, with all of the rogues, all of the villains, the nefarious five. And what we're doing here is basically trying to cure every single individual, starting with Doctor Otto Octavius. Now, they did a phenomenal job. Like, uh, <sighs> Alfred Molina coming back as Otto Octavius is awesome in and of itself, right? But then also adding another dimension to the character that I feel like we didn't get to see the first time around that also doesn't invalidate or alter what came before. I mean, that that is awesome. And what I mean by that is the idea that the voices in his head are pretty much making him go insane in a lot of sense, and that's really why he's a villain. Um, it's it's so fascinating because in Spider-Man 2, it seems more like the the arms are voices in his head, but it's like a conversation, and like they're not really controlling him or anything. But this this film adds another dimension to that, being like, no, he's insane because there's so many loud voices in his head, or maybe there's only four, but it's very loud, and he's always like he's always hearing things, and as a result, he has gone mad, and it's like he can't be peaceful he can't have a moment of rest because of his arms peter cures him peter cures him also with the help of norman osborne which is very interesting um but he cures him and immediately dr otto octavius is no longer the villain He's not a monster. He never was. I mean, the main thing here was that he lost everything in the last film. And all he really wanted was to finish his work because he had nothing else left. He needed money and, and all of this, that, and the other. But, like, he wouldn't have done that normally. It's because of the arms that were messing with his brain, that were connected to his nervous system. Like, it was screwing with his head. And as a result, he was doing things that he wouldn't normally have done. And now that the voices are gone, now that, the, now that his brain is protected by a new and improved inhibitor chip, here we are. Otto Octavius is a good guy again. He is 
the man that Tobey Maguire knew at the start of that film. And he is the guy that ultimately becomes a hero as a result. And and it's awesome to see because we basically get to see his arc from Spider-Man to again, but also extended a little bit more. And it's great. It's just, it doesn't take away anything, but it highlights new aspects and it adds to the original story in a new and interesting way. My God, I cannot believe what they did with Green Goblin Norman Osborn. I mean, wow. This man gave me chills again. Hearing Hearing the goblin voice, seeing the goblin mask hanging there, and Norman laying on the ground as like a shell of a man, not re- like feeling complete powerlessness while talking to the goblin, and and oh, just I'm in awe of this film because this is not something I thought I would ever get to see in my life it's not something i ever expected or even like toyed with in my brain as something that i could potentially see before this year the portrayal of norman osborne and the dichotomy between osborne and the goblin is just so well done the laugh the difference in voice i mean Norman is like a weak, like sounding, weak-willed man, and the goblin is sure of himself, angrier, strong in his tone, and it is awesome. It is absolutely awesome to watch, because you are in shock, you are like in awe, you are just wondering what is this man going to do, and from that moment onward, when he destroys his mask, you know he is going to, he is going to be the one that either makes or breaks what is happening, what Peter is trying to do, right? Because immediately he is helping Peter save Dr. Otto Octavius, and then from there, the goblin comes back. Because, and the, and the way that they do it, the way that they bring him back in this film is just fantastic. I mean, he's walking around with like purple and green, and it's beautiful and awesome because it looks like very similar and akin to his comic book outfit. But then on top of that, you have him helping Peter, and then all of a sudden, he's in the room with Otto and, and, and Green Goblin, right? He's in that room. He's in that room. And his spider sense goes on and it's the most cinematic and beautiful part of this film. It looks awesome. Like it is the greatest interpretation of the spider sense that we have seen in these last three films. And it's just so cool because he doesn't know what's happening. He knows something is wrong and he walks around into the other room and he's like, what the heck's going on? What's happening? Who is it? Who is about to attack? What is going on? I don't know what's going on. May needs to get out of here because she's right behind me. And then he he looks at Otto and then looks at Norman and webs him right there. Right there. He webs Norman Osborn. And it's like, yes. Yes. This is like Norman caused the greatest interpretation of the spider sense since I think Tobey Maguire. <sighs> Like, Toby has some really, really cool scenes with his spider sense, like the scene with him having lunch with with uh, with MJ and Doc Ock coming in. Like, that's a good scene, but, like, this is so well done as well, and I loved it. Just fantastic. And so what we have here is a battle, mainly between Norman and Peter, and Norman is kicking Peter's ass. But because he is stronger, it seems like he is stronger than Peter because Goblin is super strong, like he is so powerful and Goblin makes this film so much more brutal, so much more terrifying. He increases the stakes here to a whole nother level and it's fantastic because he is the one to kill Aunt May. And we get the greatest line ever. We get the classic line, the line that we have not seen in the MCU yet, that we assumed he heard at some point, but we're just not going to get. With great power comes great responsibility. And it's like, because you hear that and you know she's done. You know it's the end. It's, It's the end of that character. 
And she gets done in by being hit by Norman's glider. This glider was once used to kill Norman Osborne. This glider is terrifying. This glider slams into Aunt May. I thought she was already dead, but no, she gets up and then she dies. Like she, ugh. Green Goblin in this film, man, it's so good. So, so good. And so from here, Peter's on the run and just, I'm sorry. I just have to take a second. This film is awesome. Peter's on his own. He's like sad and upset. And he's like, you know what? We are, I'm just going to be sad and upset on my own. And Ned and, and MJ are like, all right, we got to find Peter Parker. And at this point in the film, I'm like, you know, we're not going to get the Spider-Man. If they show up, it's going to be at the very end. It's going to be when that spell goes awry. Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, maybe Andrew Garfield. Definitely Tobey, I think, at this point is like more likely. And they, they might come in and, and help Peter in this final battle. Not going to be a big thing. Not be going to be a huge deal. Just going to be a few cool moments. And instead... Ned finds the Spider-Man because he can use magic. And they tease this at the start of the film too a little bit, which is awesome. Like they foreshadow it a little bit and he knows how to use the sling ring. First off, you know, Doctor Strange, you better start teaching this boy because he's a he's better than you at magic, man. Because it took you forever to get to use that sling ring. And this kid just just figures it out in a day. So you should kind of feel ashamed a little bit strange. Like, it took you that much effort, man. It took you almost dying. Ned just kind of had to be like, I want to find Peter, man. I want to find Peter. I want to find Peter. And he finds Andrew Garfield. It took me a minute to compute what was happening because he walked through. You see the back of his suit, and I'm like, that looks different. Like, when did Peter change? And then he takes off his mask, and it's Andrew Garfield. But it's Andrew Garfield, and he's here, and he's he's in there in his glory, and he has to prove that he's actually Peter Parker, prove that he's Spider-Man. It's an awesome scene, wonderful. And they do the same thing. They bring out Tobey Maguire, and I think, oh, he's just... Is he retired? Like, where's his suit? What's going on? Because I honestly thought, like, maybe he's retired now. Maybe there aren't any supervillains. And he's just kind of, like, you know, dressed in civilian clothes because of that. But no, he has the suit underneath. It's fine. We'll see it later. And... It's just awesome because we get Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield in this film and they're there and you're like, oh my God. The rumors were real. They were real. And I'm like, this, this, all my wishes have come true. Like there's nothing, there's nothing more that I need here. This is amazing. This is awesome. Like I love this. All right. Now let's talk about the science bro scene. I mean, we got Peter, Peter, and Peter. They're all chilling in the room. I thought we might get a little bit more teases of stuff that happened after um, their respective films. We do get a little bit of a taste for Andrew Garfield and, you know, what, MJ and MJ and uh, Toby, how they, like, kind of work things out. But we don't really get any, like, you know, hints at other villains or anything like that. I think it kind of would have been cool to see a little bit more there. Maybe one of them, you know, knows and Ned leads. And, you know, he's, I believe, I believe Ned is supposed to become like Hopgoblin or something. And I think that would be really cool. Or like maybe it's Jackal. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, but he's supposed to become a supervillain. And it would, it would have been really, really cool if they showed something like that. But they didn't. It's fine. Not a big deal. But, you know, it was something that I thought, oh, maybe it would be cool to see something like that. But we get this cool scene where all three Peters are doing their respective intelligent things. And they're not all the same. I mean, Toby and, uh, and, and Andrew are, you know, somewhat similar because they're both capable of like sciencey things but it, it seems like peter is a little bit more of the engineering side and like andrew is working on like a, a chemical mixture so maybe he's more like a chemical expert or like a, he works more in the sciences right and then um and then andrew is working on some things on his own so it's it's very cool because they're all doing their respective things and it shows how intelligent all of them are and, and it builds up oh yeah tom holland is actually very smart it's just like he's been he's having like he's had mentors all this time so we haven't really seen it as much and and I, I just, I loved it so much. It was a lot of fun. And of course, let's talk about the final fight. This fight is beautiful. Because it's, it's just a home run. 
it's a home run, man. It's like Avengers Endgame final battle levels of it's a home run. It's awesome. We get to see a couple of fantastic moments. And, and you know, Flint Marco's there because, you know, we need him in, in the final act. He's, he's, he's not really a villain, but, like, he's coming here to attack for, for some unknown reason. Like, I think he's just... He's just not grasping that he could just wait like 10 minutes and things would be fine. Like he could just go home and he could be like no longer a Sandman, but whatever. I He's also there, but like, it's so cool because you start off with like the two older Spider-Man and, and, and Tom, they're running around trying to fight their respective people. They're not really working together very well because those two have never worked on a team. And, and Tom is like the only one that's worked on a team before. And it's like, he's building, he's bringing something new to the fold and he's able to kind of lead the other two. And then they all kind of have a better understanding and work together a little bit better after that point. And it's very, very cool because Tom is the least experienced. He's the least experienced but he's used to being and working with other people and that's what makes it different and that's what allows him to take a little bit of a different role here in that he's no longer the kid that like people tell what to do no he's like telling people how to act and and you know he's kind of like the playmaker a little bit and it's very very cool because he, he is showing his chops as a leader which is something that we've desperately needed to see i think from this peter parker it's a very different angle here and i loved it mj falls off the roof and you already know what's about to happen you already know what's about to happen you're like you're not about to kill mj or if you do i will be so pissed off because andrew garfield's right there and it's like what you can't you can't you can't and you got, okay, you're seeing Peter, he's falling down, I'm like, alright, I guess they're not doing the Andrew Garfield thing, he's not gonna be able to redeem himself in this moment, and then Goblin grabs him, and then Goblin grabs him, and you're like, didn't that happen in the original fight with Gwen Stacy, um, in, in the comics, I think that, like, he gets stopped at some point, or something like that, um, but I could be wrong about that, but I, I thought that maybe that was a comic book reference, where Peter gets pushed out of the way, and then he has to come down, and he's too late, right? And then you have Andrew, and he comes down, and he saves Mary Jane's life. And this this moment is the only moment in the entire film that made me tear up, because he has Mary Jane in his hands, or, or on the ground, or whatever. He like saves her life, and is like, are you okay? And she is. And he starts tearing up, because he's remembering what happened to Emma Stone, to Gwen Stacy. And it's just, it's it's so cathartic as a viewer to see him be able to save MJ's life. And it's just like, wow, I'm so happy. I'm so happy for you, Andrew. Like, you needed this moment, especially after what you said about how you got angrier and you got more aggressive and you stopped pulling your punches and maybe now you can heal. Now, Doctor Strange is here, you know, he's like holding up the portal or whatever, trying to trying to save the multiverse or whatever, or he's trying to save the planet basically from being overrun with people. And we have a final fight between Green Goblin and Tom. And you know what's coming. You know what's coming. You're like, is he gonna kill him? Is this a real death match? Is that what is that what's happening right now? And it is. For Tom, it is. He's about to kill this man. He knocks him down. He beats him and beats him and beats him to a pulp. And he's on the ground. And he grabs his glider. And in this moment, I'm like, oh my god, the disrespect that he is showing to Goblin right now. Oh my god. He is about to kill this man with the glider again. Again. And you're just like, oh, this is about to happen. Oh my gosh. I, I, I was not ready. I am not ready for this moment. I am not ready for this moment. And then you see Toby and Andrew look at each other and Toby jumps in. And he's like, no. Don't do it. I understand, but don't do it. And it's like, this is the big brother vibe that we always needed, that we always wanted, and that we deserved. And Toby's like, don't. It's not worth it. 
don't do this. And then he gets stabbed. I thought they were going to kill him. If they killed him, I would have cried. Like, it would have been bad. It would have... It would have been so bad. And I'm so happy that they didn't because, oh my god. Like, no. They couldn't have done it. It, it would be, I would be pissed and sad and, and upset. But also, like, wow. They stab him. And you're, you're in shock in the theater. You're just like... Is Toby about to die? And he doesn't. And it's beautiful. It's fine. And now... The fight is over. Because Norman's cured. Let's talk about the ending. Peter Parker... Is now all alone. No friends. No mentors. No family. He's all on his own. He's got nothing and no one. I will say, the most upsetting part of this is that people don't even know that he was on May's nephew. That is the most upsetting part of this. Everything else, all the others that forget about him, it's it's fine. Truly, it's fine. Because they're still there. But the one person who raised him He's always been there for him. No one even remembers that they knew each other. Let's talk about what this means, though. This is a soft reboot now for this character. Peter Parker is going to college. And we're going to get different stories and potentially different characters. And I hope, I really, really hope that Tom Holland sticks with this role. Because it seemed like he might be leaving. I don't want him to leave because college Peter Parker is a story that we all need and that hasn't properly been told yet. Not really. I mean, Toby kind of did it with three and in two, but it's not really a big part of the story. Like him being in college and two isn't a part of the story really at all. And we need Peter Parker working in the lab and him meeting new villains and being Spider-Man, and having it things not go his way, and struggling because no one's there as a safety net for him. That is the Peter Parker that we need to see moving forward. Potentially him, you know, having to sell pictures to Jonah because it's so difficult to get pictures of Spider-Man that are good, or having him meet Eddie Brock, and that could be another arc, and Eddie can become a villain. He could be Venom again, and... They could bring back all these different characters and he can meet and team up with characters that he might know or they might be new. I mean, it's it's it opens the door for so much and I'm so excited. Ultimately, this film was meant for the fans who have grown up with Spider-Man over the last 20 years. And this movie delivers. As a Spider-Man fan... I am so grateful to have been able to sit in the theater and watch something this phenomenal. So all I got to say is thank you to all the actors that came back. I mean, thank you so much. Because without y'all coming back, this film wouldn't have been as great as it was. Thank you to Sony and Marvel for coming together for this film because it is amazing. That's all I'll say. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know your thoughts on the Spider-Man film in the comments below. Was this your favorite Spider-Man film? And as always, if you like the video, please like the video. And subscribe for more videos from me. Thanks for watching. Bye.